GraphQL is like the kryptonite in the Batman's belt. In most days, it is a useless stone, good for nothing. But when the time comes, only kryptonite can save the day. This is a brief overview of GraphQL. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here and welcome to the crash course on GraphQL. And for all those people who are in a super hurry, there is a timestamp in the description section so that you can jump directly onto the code part, but don't bother. If you are not gonna listen to this whole conversation here, the code part is not gonna make much sense. So have patience and listen to me out. First, who is this video targeted for? This video is not targeted if you are still struggling with for loops and functions and that's totally okay. But this video is not gonna make much sense for you. You can still watch it, grab some of the things here, but it's not gonna serve you well. This video is targeted for those people who have at least seen once how the API calls are being made, especially the REST API, things like get request, post request, delete request. If you have taken them down at least once in any web or mobile application, then this video is going to make so much more sense to you. GraphQL, in a short, if I want to explain, is like a query language for API. In our regular API calls, especially the REST API calls where we do all the update, delete, read, create, all the CRUD stuff, GraphQL can make life a little bit more easier, but it also comes with its cons as well. So I'm gonna try to explain a little bit on detail that what are the situations where GraphQL can be handful for you and in what situation you should avoid it. Okay, first, let's make sure that whenever I say one request, in your mind, you multiply it by something a big number, like 50 million or maybe 80 million. And that's only when the GraphQL is going to make sense. For example, let's just say we have a web page, and on the web page, I have all the information about the courses, maybe the course name, its pricing, and a bunch of other information. And on that same page, I have some of the teaching assistant information where I put first name, last name, and experience. And in a usual scenario, you don't want to put everything in a single table in the database. You would like to split that off. So in the course, there would be a reference to the teaching assistant, and then the teaching assistant table can be accessed, and you can grab, maybe let's just say, experience from that. Now, how we're going to do that in the REST API call? It's going to be a little bit tricky. We're going to first fetch all the courses, then we'll grab the reference of the teaching ID, then we'll again make a call on that teaching assistant, and we'll grab the experience. And this is not too much if your application is of decent size, maybe serving, let's just say, 400,000 people or 500,000 people. So there's just two extra requests that we have made. But in the case of when I multiply these numbers by 80 million or 50 million, these two requests puts so much of extra load on the server and the traffic is also going to be a concern. And this is exactly why the GraphQL was designed by Facebook. They were handling and they are still handling insane amount of traffic and this traffic needs as much as low load as it can possibly do. So GraphQL helps you to nitpick the data that you only want from something. Not to dump down the entire data and then nitpick, but rather the traffic don't get congested and you select the data that you want and GraphQL returns you only that data. And that's the whole power of GraphQL. So if your application is struggling and is facing huge amount of traffic, then GraphQL can save the day. Okay, so we can nitpick the data, but what about the cons of the GraphQL? Now the cons is not something that you can look at the very first, if somebody is doing all the backend work. GraphQL actually makes everything so much smooth and so much good looking at the front end side, but on the behind the scene, on the back end, it makes everything so much messy. There are so much of the configuration needed and so much of the things like resolvers and whole bunch of other things that needs to be done. And when it comes to the debugging part, it's not really the greatest of the thing to debug, the messages are not very prompt, and it's a whole lot another nightmare to debug the application that are using GraphQL. But if your application is facing so much of traffic, it's worth investing the time and the effort. So now that you know the brief overview about the GraphQL, I would highly recommend to stick around and let me design a simple application of exactly what we have discussed here. We're gonna design a simple application where we have a lot of courses that we can add into fictitious database or just a variable. And then we're gonna fetch some of the experience of the teaching assistants. And this whole scenario is designed in such a way that everybody can understand the power of GraphQL, can see the underlying complexity as well as can explore these things further on their own. 
And now, before we move on to the computer, there's one more important thing. Make sure you have hit that subscribe button. If you haven't hit that yet, no worries. We are not going anywhere. Neither me, neither you are. You can hit that whenever you like. So now, let's move on to the computer and try to see that how we are going to code this simple example and try to get more about what GraphQL is and how it looks like and how it feels to code a GraphQL application from the scratch. Oh, sorry, one more thing. If you want more such crash courses and maybe a version two of this GraphQL, let me know in the comment section. Based on your comments, I pick up what's going, to, what's going to be the next crash course that we are gonna put up. So make sure you hit that comment section and let me know what more you want. And I'll pick up definitely your request on the priority. And now finally, let's move on to computer. Hey there everyone, welcome to the computer. And I hope you got the basic idea of what we are trying to do, at least basic overview of that. So in this video, we're gonna get started with that. Yes, I've created a very, very teeny tiny uh, some of the text that you should know about GraphQL first. The important word is pick specific data. That's the whole idea of the GraphQL that instead of putting out a request through the REST API and grabbing all the data, we're gonna be picking up some specific data and we'll be doing it everything from the scratch. I will be using the core uh, node NPM express for dealing up with this entire situation. Surely it can be done through Graph, uh, Apollo GraphQL and a bunch of other things. We'll be going bare minimum basics. But before that, I would like to put out a simple kind of a disclaimer note that there are many ways of how you implement GraphQL, variety of tools. And if you're even if you're using same tools, there are lots of syntax that GraphQL support. This is one of the many ways and I have tried to focus on the keyword easy way so that everybody can understand what's happening here. So make sure we are cutting corners here. Things like in detail, like pagination and stuff, we are not going there, but I'll cover enough that you get a brief idea. In the world of GraphQL, we cannot actually talk about GraphQL without touching on these two topics, which are schema and resolvers. I'm not saying these are the only ones. Yes, there are pagination and bunch of others, which I will tell you, but these are the basic heart of the entire GraphQL if you want to design or develop a server for that. The goal is really simple. We want to create a new entry and we want to read that entry. And specifically, we want to create a new course, fictitiously, of course. And in the course, we want to have a few entries that we want to have. And selectively, we want to pick up only some information from that entry, not to dump down all of the entries that are stored in the database. So that's the whole idea of it. I will be talking about schemas, uh, simply means the structure, some of the data types that are being supported by the GraphQL. I'll be picking up the easy syntax, not the lengthy and the longer one, so that things can be easy and sanity can be remained up here. And then we're gonna talk about resolvers, which is a really confusing term, but when we code it, actually, it becomes much more easier. And that's all, that's all I have got for the theory for you. So let's go ahead and move on. So this is officially the website, graphql.org slash learn, where you can spend your more time, can learn more about this query language, and specifically a query language for API, it sounds very exciting. I'll be using the same syntax that is mentioned up here. Don't you worry, I'll walk you through an easy way in that. But there is another syntax which is also being supported. It's much more lengthier. It looks more like a JavaScript-ish. But this is much more cleaner and that's why I prefer it this one. Also the documentation mentioned that at the top, so they also recommend it. But we're not going into things like authorization, pagination, as you can see, caching and a whole bunch of other things is also there, which are really amazing, but we cannot go too much in depth. We will be going things like available, some of uh, the type schemas, some of the scalar ones, enumerations and bunch of interfaces and basic stuff. We will be definitely going into some of the stuff uh, which are I'll not mentioned here, but they are very important one. So spend more time in case you are looking up for. Okay, so how we're gonna get started? Now, usually I always get started from the bare minimum basic, but since we are into a bit more advanced-ish kind of a level here, I have already prepared a simple URL for you. It, it is hosted on github.com slash Hitesh Chaudhary slash LCO dash GraphQL. There is nothing inside this package, but it is just there so that it makes sure we all are standing on the same ground. So go ahead and click on the download and I'll be downloading a zip on my desktop uh, for this one. So go ahead and save this one and let's go ahead and unzip this one. And once you unzip, it's gonna say LCO GraphQL dash main. Make sure you rename it to just LCO GraphQL. Now fire up your VS code. Here's my VS code. 
So once you rename it, just make sure you drag and drop this LCO-GraphQL up here, and that's all you're gonna see. Now, why we are using this special uh, zip file here or a repository here, it's just simply to make sure that we all are standing on the same page. When we write something related to ES6, it doesn't give us any error because some of you might be on different system. So we wanted to just make sure everybody is on the same page. As you can see in the index.js, it's just empty. There is nothing. But in the package.json, I have got some of the ES6 and Babel configuration being done here. So nothing to be worried. All you gotta do up here is just say npm install and just hit enter. It's gonna install some of the repo some of the dependencies on here. And now all you gotta do is in case you want to run it, there is just one simple command for doing everything, which is npm uh, start. And regardless of what configuration you have done or not, after running the npm install, npm start is gonna just run everything fine here. But that's not it. We want to work on the GraphQL. So there's gonna be a few dependencies on which we want to work. So we're gonna install these dependencies all together. So let's go ahead and work on with that. So I'm gonna simply say npm install. And then first thing that we need is express, which will help us to set up our server. But since we'll be working with the GraphQL, so make sure the GraphQL also gets installed, but also there is another one which is express-graphql. This will help us to connect the GraphQL and Express together so that we can have a route in the browser. We can visit that and can turn on all the GraphQL tools that are given to us by BASIC. Apart from this, I will be using a Nano ID, which is like a simpler version of UUID. Feel free to use UUID as well. Uh, it's not really compulsory to use it in case you want to wish, you can use directly a crypto. All I want is just a unique ID which will be used later on. So these are the only things that we need for this entirety of the crash course. It's not gonna take much of the time, pretty simple one. And just to verify it again, we can go up into package.json and can see our dependencies. So express, express GraphQL, GraphQL, Nano ID, NodeMon was already there. So any version is gonna work absolutely fine. It's not gonna do any kind of breakage to our application. So we are all good and all fine. Okay. Now let's go ahead and obviously set up some of the stuff for us. So let's go into index.js and we can just remove everything here. So first thing we always do is let's go ahead and grab express and that will be coming up from express. Once the express is available, we are gonna go ahead and create an app from express. There we go, nice and easy. And this app is going to be showing some route to us. So let's just say we are gonna have a get method and thus this will be on the slash means home route and we will be sending some response on that so request response go ahead and use your es6 methods and then we're going to say res.send and we're going to simply send up a simple message that will say up and running with graphql crash course sounds good and now we need to make sure that our server is listening to any port which feels very favorite to you. So app.listen and let's just say we are gonna run it on uh, maybe 80, 81, 82, whatever, okay. And we're gonna go ahead and fire this up. So console log will say running at, let's just say 80, 82. Yeah, that seems good. Okay, now let's go ahead and run this up here. So all we gotta do is npm start. In case we haven't done any typo, things should be good. And we are running at 82. So all we gotta do is now let's go on to localhost. So localhost, and this time we are on 8082. So whatever feels good to you. So it says up and running with GraphQL crash course. Okay, that is fine. Now let's go ahead and move on to creating a couple of files which will help us to make sure that our GraphQL is up and running. There are majorly three parts in the GraphQL if you want to go at the very minimum basic, very bare minimum basic. The first is schema, the second is resolver, and the third is tiny bit configuration which can be done in the index file or wherever you like. So let's go ahead and work on with that. So first thing that we are gonna do is we are going to create a new file just right in this directory. We're gonna call this one as schema. So let's go ahead and work on schema.js. Now this schema is gonna be coming up from the GraphQL. So don't you worry on that part. Let's go ahead and hit enter on this one. 
the first thing that we do up here is we are going to import something from GraphQL. This is a core GraphQL thing. The first thing that we want to have and the only thing that we are going to have is going to be the build schema. There are a couple of other types of variations of schema here, but the bare minimum that you need is going to be build schema. Now we're going to build kind of a very elaborate schema to understand it like a whole lot of it. So have patience here. So let's call this one as a schema, schema, there we go. And this one is going to be build schema. We goes like this and make sure you use the back ticks. This is not the single quotes. These are back ticks just below your escape key. And we're going to hit an enter. And this is where we write entirety of our schema, but that's not it. We need to export that. So let's go ahead and export it first here. Export default schema. Okay. So coming on board to the point that how a schema works and what is the syntax of it. In case you noticed it up here, this is exactly the syntax that we are using. Things like type query and type user. Now the query is a very specific type. I will discuss on that in a second, but right now let's follow along up here. So all I'm going to do here is first the keyword type comes up and then I'm going to simply say it as course. Now you don't need to call it specifically course. This is not a reserve keyword. This is a schema for my object that I want to do. So I want to build a course structure here. So I'm going to say type of course. Now inside this, you mentioned that what type of values are going to come up and what's the name of that value. So in this case, I'm going to say ID, which is a specific type of ID. Then you don't put a comma in this one. This is a very common mistake. So you don't put and separate the values with the comma. I'm going to say I have a course name as well, which is of type string. So yes, strings are supported. No surprise in there. Then we are going to have a category. And again, let's call it as a string as well. I have a little bit change up here. So we are going to have a price and without any doubt, integers are supported. Floats are also supported. Uh, a couple of bunch of arrays and stuff also are being supported. So let's just say in what uh, language this course is being created, maybe in the English, uh, maybe some regional local French language or Marathi, whatever the language and the email associated with this course, whoever is designing, you guessed it. There is a lot that we can do up here. Interestingly, the whole goal of this course is to have teaching assistant. So I'm going to say that teaching assists are there and this one is an array. So if you want to support an array, you can just go ahead and say that this is going to be array of strings. But in case you want to have inside in here further a custom type, you can actually go ahead and do that. I'm going to simply say teaching assist is its own data type, which is like a, again, a kind of a data type. So how we're going to work on with that, just like we have created this type course, we can actually go ahead and create another one. So I'm going to simply say type in case I don't make a mess, I'll copy and paste. There we go. So teaching assist is again going to be of type. It has a property of first name, which is a string. We are going to have last name, which is going to be a type of string. Then we are going to have an experience. If I can write that, come on experience, which is going to be of type of int. So as you can see that we have a lot of flexibility of whether to use inbuilt data type like strings or something, or if you want to have a custom data type, you can actually just define it and can make a dependency based on that. But not only that, what is the most interesting is that it supports some of my favorite type as well. Things like enum is also being supported. So instead of calling it as type, we go ahead and call it as enum. So let's just say in the enum, I want to use something like stack. So let's just say that inside in here, after the email, there is a stack, which is of type of a stack. Now why enum is my favorite type. So notice here, I have used a stack here. So I'm going to define an enumeration of stack. What it's going to do in the enum, you don't mention this kind of a syntax, like first name, colon and stuff. You only provided the, you only provide the choices here. Like for example, the course can be on a web stack, uh, maybe a mobile stack. I'm not using more than mean, but um, just you get the point other and stuff like that. So in case you are designing an application for maybe uh, airplane, so aisle, middle or window seat. So I want the user only to select something from this drop down. You can actually go ahead and do that. And you will notice that this stack and this mention of the rules are actually very well uh, 
being governed by this GraphQL. And you're going to notice that when we are going to launch the GraphQL. Okay, so this is the basic type that you can create for any of your objects in the GraphQL. This is the basic schema. But this is the schema that we have given, like how my structure will look like in a kind of a database would be wrong word here, but how it is actually being structured somewhere. Now, coming on to the point, now we have another thing, which is the most famous one, is the query type. Query. And there are so many ways how you can query the data. So what happens is, whenever we get a query, the query is being resolved by someone. And that someone is known as resolver. Resolver will be responsible for accepting a query and sending the response based on whatever is your logic. We will do that. So let's go ahead and create a method. Let's call it as get course, uh, kind of a getters and setters. But you can call this anyone and you can respond to a hard coded response as well. But I don't recommend that. So this ex ex accepts that uh, expects that you're going to be sending some ID and the ID will be provided here. The mentioning of data type is very, very essential. And what we'll be returning him is going to be a course. So what I'm saying here is there will be a method in my resolvers, which I haven't talked yet. And this will be responsible. Or first, let's just say that this is going to be a method which accepts ID and it will return you a course data type. If it would be returning a string data type, surely we can write a string here, no problem in that. And this is basically what you do in the query. If here also you see that if somebody says me, uh, if somebody sends a query of me, then we return him a user. We are almost doing exactly same. Somebody asks us that get me a course with this course ID, we're gonna return him a course just like that. Okay, so this is the part where we actually sets up a schema or we set some of the query that how we're going to return that, that is usually defined in the resolver. But there is one more thing. I want to set some data inside using this GraphQL as well. Because remember, we have got two goals, read the data as well as set some data as well. So for this, we have to study another type of schema here, which is known as input. So just like we have been using this type, this uh, enum, uh, this type, there is another very, very important type in the GraphQL, which is known as input. And uh, the usual standard is that we say course input. So whatever is your schema is being defined, we just say input and the name of that. Again, this is just a standard good coding practice. Feel free to use it. Feel free to skip it. So we're going to say input course, input teaching assist and stuff like that. Okay, so I call it as teaching assist here. I, here I call it as teach assist. I think we should be a little bit more consistent. We should call it as teaching assist. And here also it should be teaching assist. Yeah, just for the sake of consistency. Okay, moving further, let's say how we're gonna take input from the user. We just say input first, just like we say type, we say input here, and then whatever the name suits to you. Have this curly braces, hit enter, and now, the good way is actually here to copy and paste. This is the one case where I say copying and pasting is much, much better. Because obviously, if you have a field which expects you to have some data, all the fields should be available in the input field. Obviously, it makes sense. But there's a little bit more to it. If you want that certain fields should be very compulsory without that I cannot create an entry for that, we're going to go ahead and put an exclamation sign on that. Exclamation sign simply means this is a compulsory field. You cannot avoid it. If you want to create an entry, you have to provide that. And you can put it up anywhere. Let's just say we put it on price. We just say put it on teaching assistant. So these are now all the fields which are compulsory. We have to provide them. ID is not compulsory because we will be generating it based on the nano ID or the UUID, whatever you're having. But the point is, yeah, that's how it works. So I told you it's really simple in the schema syntax. So we're going to simply say input and we are going to use teaching assist, copy that, paste that. And we just uh, kind of a pre uh, prefix it with input. So, or we can say, nope, we are going to post fix that. So we're following a standard here. So course input and whatever the name of your schema input. So this is how the basics is going to go. We're going to go ahead and hit an enter and again, as I told you, it's a good idea to have this one here. So copy this and paste this up here. Okay, 
I know this is a little bit more, uh, but this is like the basics of the input. Now there is just one last thing before we go further. We have taken the input, but just like here, the type query and there was a method of which was responsible of getting the data. There is one more thing which is of type. Let me go ahead up here. Type and we call this as mutation. Now this is again a keyword. We don't actually change this one. This is a mutation. And this will be responsible for filling the data in the database is not really the right word, but whatever you are throwing the data inside, whether it's a, data, a database or in-memory database or a variable that you have created, whatever that is, inside that, filling up the data is the job of mutation. Mutation simply means a change. So whenever you want to change any data, it usually goes through with the mutation. So we're gonna call this one as uh, simply create course. That was a get course. This one is set course or create course, however you like to go with that. Now in that, we actually say there will be input coming up. This input will be of type. I hope you guessed it. Yep, exactly this type. So input will be of course type. And once this is done, we are gonna get back the entire course object. Yeah, loosely calling it as object, but yeah. So we will be returning this object. Now, we actually throw the entire object back, but it's the GraphQL's job to nitpick that data and show us only what is expected there. You'll get more onto that, but this is whole. Okay, so quickly summarizing, the schema is a place where you define the structure of your objects or whatever you are, you are creating. I have got this course and I have a few fields here like ID, string, integers, there can be more. There can be dependent field as well, like teaching assistant, we are having this teaching assist. And then we are defining some of the types like first name, last name, experience, you can have more. I've also tried to demonstrate you a little bit on the enum because this is my favorite. I don't usually avoid that. Enum is really the most powerful and error prone thing to have in the database. And then we are having two important types. One is query that is responsible for getting some data. And then there is a type mutation, which is responsible for setting some of the data. Now, if you're setting some data, obviously the input is going to be responsible for that. And as many fields you are setting, there is gonna be input for them. Okay, so that's the basic of schema and now we can close this up. Okay, nice and easy. Now, next thing up, we are gonna need a little bit a talk on the resolver. Now, resolver is something which is gonna get some uh, work to be done. So all the methods that we have kind of a design in our, uh, this schema methods, uh, this get course, as well as create course, these are gonna be all filled up in the resolver, okay. Let's go ahead and close this one and let's create a new file. We're gonna call this one as simply resolvers.js. Now, once we are in the resolvers, first thing that I'm gonna be doing is I will be importing something from nano ID because I'll be using that in a second. Nano ID, okay. Now, one thing that I would like to mention here that to make this course a little bit easier to understand and follow through, I'm not using GraphQL tools. GraphQL tools are the way how we actually persist the data in uh, MongoDB or Postgres or whatever the database you're using. I will not be doing that. I will be just storing them inside a variable and that's it. So we obviously got to have some variable up here. Let's go ahead and work on with that. So let's go ahead and create a simple fictitious class here. So let's just go ahead and call this one as course. Inside the course, I will expect a constructor here. So inside the constructor, we are gonna separate an ID just like that. And rest of the things are gonna be an object. So we have a course, course name, and then we have a category. And I would like to borrow some of the things from here because I don't want to miss any of that. Okay, so these are the fields. Let's go ahead and copy them for a minute and paste them up here. So we got course name, category, price, we got a language, email, and a stack, and a teaching assist. So these are all the fields that are gonna be there. Okay, let's go ahead and remove that. So we have created a simple constructor and constructor expects that you are gonna be filling up all these values and once this is being done, we have to set them up. So we're gonna simply say this dot and ID is gonna be ID and similarly this dot course name is gonna be course name, this dot 
category is gonna be category. Yes, I have to do it all for all of them. Okay, so now that we have a class, uh, which is like a very dummy class, basically what we are doing is we, we are trying to create an object, a placeholder through which we can actually set some data. And what we're gonna call this one here as, uh, let's create a variable, let's call this one as simply uh, course uh, holder, <laughs> that's a good name. And this is gonna be an empty object. So what we're gonna be creating or how we will be doing in this object, we'll be having a key value pairs. So the key is gonna be the ID of that particular course and the value is gonna be all the data that we are sending it up. And that's what we'll be holding in this course holder. Surely we can push this exact value into the database as well. Pretty standard stuff, but we won't be going too much in that. Now, this is all the basic work. This has nothing to do with the GraphQL. This is all a simple kind of a boilerplate code that we absolutely need. The most important thing that we need is this resolver. So this resolvers is gonna be the whole part of how we actually do this stuff. Now, it's not really compulsory to call it resolver, but please stick to resolver in this case also. Uh, it's gonna make much more sense later on. Okay, we're gonna be going in directly like this. Now, it is very important that whatever the methods you have defined in your schema, you actually name them exactly same. First is the get course. So how it's gonna get course is we're gonna have this one, this resolver here. And how this resolver works, this actually is going to be a simple method, just like that. And what do you expect? It expects that somebody is gonna give us an ID. There we go, that's it. Once the ID is being given, we're gonna go ahead and simply return a course. So let's go ahead and say new course uh, based on the ID that you are providing me. And since we are storing the key value pair, then I can simply say that course holder return the value which is having this ID. So there we go, we have got this one covered. Pretty simple, pretty easy. Now another thing which is there in my schema is how we're gonna insert the data which is create course. So in this case, uh, notice here we are not doing much. We are just uh, storing them inside an object and then we are throwing them out. So another one here, put up a comma and there is another resolver here. So again, this is a simple method just like that. And here, what do you expect that somebody if you noticed up here, is providing you this input. So what do we do is we just take this input just like that. And once this input is up here, first we need to create ID. I told you we are gonna be using a unique ID and that's why this nano ID is here. So let's just say this is my ID created by nano ID, that's it. ID is now holding a unique value. Then we're gonna use this course holder. And on this particular ID, we are gonna be setting up all the values that input is giving to us. And once this is being done, we are gonna go ahead and return something as well. So return is pretty simple, very standard. We are gonna say return the course, the ID and the input. So this is all what we are returning back. Now how you handle your data is gonna to be totally dependent on you, that how you are messing around with that. Resolver, the whole idea is, are the brain part, that how you actually read the entire data and how you actually write the data. Here we don't actually, usually don't mention that nitpicking of the stuff. Nitpicking of the stuff is actually automatically done by the GraphQL interface, which we are gonna move on to next. So this part is all done. Now we can close the resolver and the schema and moving on to the final part, which is index.js. Now the all preparation work is all done. Now it's time that we actually go ahead and bring up everything up here. So first is that we are gonna need a couple of things. We're gonna need this resolver. So it's not coming up automatically. Let's go ahead and say, I need res, we didn't export the resolvers, did we? Nope, I don't think so. Nope, we never exported that. So let's go ahead and say export default. Come on, export default resolvers. So now it should be coming up automatically. Save that. Let's try this out. Resolvers, there we go. So notice here, the resolvers is now being imported. We also need schema as well. So schema, let's bring it up. So now schema there we go schema is also being important and last but not the least thing that we are going to grab up is going to be graphql http let me show you that so we're going to be saying import 
something from and this is the only thing which comes up from this express graphql and this one is pretty simple graphql http now this graphql http uh, can make a little bit of the confusion because of the too much support that express gives us which is a good thing but sometimes it can be confusing so what actually uh, this entire express allows us to do is we can use say app.use which is a pretty standard one but it also allows us to use app.get and app.post which is a point of confusion again because most of the programs you're going to see use this app.use this is how the graphql is configured but it supports other one as well okay so let me go get up here and how to work on with that okay so first we're going to simply say app.use and then we're going to simply say that on the slash graphql we are going to be running a server here which is going to be uh, be governed by this graphql http this requires you to pass on a couple of parameters the first and the most important parameter is schema since we are bringing the schema from the schema file that we have designed so we are just putting it up i know you know es6 this is not really necessary but i'm going to still keep it it makes things more visually good and then the next thing is this GraphQL, Graphy, come on, no suggestion. So it says GraphQL and you have to turn this flag on. What this does is actually gives you a nice interface on the web so that you can use it. I'll show you that in a second. The last but not the least is actually this root value. And we're going to call this one as root, which we haven't yet defined. So we're going to go up here and we're going to define this root. So we're going to simply say const root and this root is actually where you use your resolvers but i'll use that in a second but first what i want to do is i want to show you the basics of it and i forgot a comma here there we go so in this root object what we're going to do is we're going to simply say that let's just say there is a lco value and that should be resolved by a method and this method doesn't do much anything it just says sc console.log and it just says a full form of it. I want to show you that how easy it is to have resolvers and just treat them as a functions at the starting level and this will help you a lot. Okay so quite a lot of work we have done here and now it says running at 8080. It has been crashing for a couple of times but no big deal. Now I can go back up here on my local host, hit a reload. This is running fine on 8082 and we're going to simply say give me a graph QL. And this is the basic interface uh, and it looks like there are a couple of issues here. The type of course input, teaching assist must be input type, but got teaching assist. Yeah, looks like there is a couple of issues in my schema. Let me quickly see that. Found the bug. It was not a bug, it's actually a pretty simple. Notice here we are taking all the input. So this one is not teaching assist, it should be input. So let's go ahead and give it this one as input as well. So teaching assist input copy that and just paste it there so that's pretty much it standard stuff we do a lot of bugs and mistake we can hit a reload and there we go now it's all easy so this is the whole GraphQL so notice I told you that there is a flag that we turns on so this GraphQL is actually the visualization web version of how things are going on so make sure you turn this on true the schema is necessary the root value is coming up from here so that's how it goes on Okay, so now the query has been, uh, the, the issue is being resolved up here as we can see. Now the good thing that I like about this GraphQL interface is that there are so many options that comes up here that makes your life easier. For example, the docs can read the entirety of your documentation can give you things like uh, what this root types are. Like you can fire up a query, you can fire up a mutation, mutation like you can have this create course kind of a method and it takes an input of course input and you can see that what all data you can pass on even the teaching assistance has all this of data so we can provide a whole lot of this here in the query it can it can show you that you can get a course id and the courses and a whole bunch of other things that it can be done but i wanted to mention this here because if you noticed up here it says root types and that's what this whole root is all about this root is actually loosely saying is all about the methods that you can pass on here here we have used kind of a lambda methods or whatever you call this uh, this is basically up here but if you remember we can just now remove it and can use this resolvers here so let's go ahead and say that we have this uh, resolvers there we go and now what it will do is it will go into the resolvers 
and we'll see that there are all the resolvers available to all of us. In case you have more methods, you can actually go ahead and say that. Now, if I save this, all we got to do is hit a reload one more time. And there we go. This is all it looks hopefully good. Now we can fire up some of the queries and can do a little bit more stuff on that. Okay, so now that we are back onto the seat, uh, let's go ahead and move on further into the course. So this is our basic GraphQL. And as you can see, there are a lot that we can do up here. So you're going to notice that most of the time we use this for querying the stuff. But right now in our variable, the course holder that we have created, there is nothing inside that. So we cannot perform any query. There are lots of things you can do. One of them is query. Another one is mutation. So we're going to see that how we can do mutation. Whenever we are going to do mutation, it's going to again look for into the index that who is responsible for handling all these methods and doing the mutation. So we're going to go into resolvers. And again, based on the schema, we're going to go on to resolver and it's going to see that, hey, if you want to change that data in the schema, you have mentioned that this mutation is handled by the create course. Okay, so we're going to go up here and we'll use this method and we'll pass on all the values. Let's go ahead and see how to do that in action. So in the mutation, you are going to go like this. Okay, pretty simple. Then we have just one mutation to be done here, which is create course. Now in the create course, we have to provide all the input values. So we're going to put up a colon and just like that, we are going to provide all the values. But there is one more thing. Even though you are going to provide some values, this red squiggly line on the create course is not going to go away that easily. Because we told it that once we are doing this create course, we are returning this course again. So when you're returning this course again, which is a standard practice, you have to put up a curly braces up again here and then have to return at least something, maybe an ID, uh, maybe a course name. You don't have to return the entire object. And that's the whole power of the GraphQL that you don't have to deal with the entirety of the data which travels in your network. You can just say, I want this specific thing, not the entirety of the thing. Now, moving on in this create course, you can definitely say that I want to provide a course name, which is going to be uh, JS uh, bootcamp and stuff like that boot camp. But we're going to see an error here. Let's go ahead and run this. So notice here, there are a couple of errors that says, Hey, while defining your schema, you told me that whenever I'll give an input, this course name is compulsory, but this prize and teaching assist is also compulsory using that exclamation, but you're not providing me that. So that actually uh, helps us a lot in that case. Okay, so moving on, we have a price. So let's go ahead and set 199. Then we have, oh, I forgot to mention the stack as well. So if I just say stack, notice here, I try to write something and it gives a squiggly line because in the stack, if you remember in the schema, we say that we can only choose between the web, between the mobile or the others. So I'm going to go ahead and choose mobile. So that's also being supported. And then we have got course, rest of the fields are not compulsory. So we're going to avoid them. Then we have this teaching assists, which if you remember, we marked that as an array. And this array is an object again. So it has few properties we decided first name is going to be that. And then we have last name, which is going to be come on, there we go. And then experience, which is going to be let's just say one year of experience separated by comma another object. So let's go ahead and get some first name, which is going to be Raul or Rahul depends on what country you are talking in. And then we are going to be saying last name, let's give it an Indian last name. And then we are going to have experience, let's just say four years, maybe. Okay. Now notice here that we have got the entire mutation being set up. Now I can run this and it says I have created a course with this unique ID from the nano ID and the course name is GS bootcamp. It's giving me the course name because I only asked it to give me the course name. I could have done the entire course object or more specific information if I wanted to, but this is all I need. Now moving on, I'll copy this course ID. And now it's time to learn about another querying procedure on the GraphQL. This was mutation. And another one is actually firing up a query. Now this is much more fun way. In every query, just like 
there needs a resolver to resolve this query, just like the mutation need a resolver to add the data into the variable that we have created. If you notice up here, we have got just one here, which is a get code. So this is my method. And this method expects you to pass on an ID. So let's go ahead and pass on an ID just like that. And we can go ahead and grab the entirety of the object, but that's not fun. This is GraphQL. So we're going to hit enter. I need ID, so provide me that. And I need teaching assist as well, but I don't need everything from the teaching assist. I just need the experience out of it. So I can just go ahead and run this one. Now notice here, I'm not dumping down the entirety of the data. I can even avoid the ID if I want, and I can just have all the experience of all the teaching assistants that are available to me. Is it overkill? It depends. It heavily depends on what kind of application you are building. So this much of work of just having reduction in the traffic in the network as well as a load on the server, if that makes sense, then definitely GraphQL is for you. If all of this work doesn't make sense for you, for your small application, definitely GraphQL doesn't make sense for you. So quite a lot of stuff, quite a lot of work. It's not really tough. Is it involved? Yes, a little bit involved, but is it fun? Definitely, <laughs> yes, it is too much fun. This is just scratching the surface of what the GraphQL is. If you want me to cover it in more depth, let me know in the comment section. I would love to create some more uh, resources for this one. Let's catch up in the next one. That's it, Mr. Batman. We are done for the GraphQL right now. And we both are gonna catch up in another video.